Hello to those of us, those joining us from Pace University here online. Uh, we're about to have a discussion of food, feelings, facts, uh, GMOs, um, how we can manage our food system heading toward 9 billion people with the fewest regrets, both uh, environmental and in terms of public health and nutrition, and finding the balance between uh, technology and uh, tradition and more. We have a great list of speakers. You'll learn more about them soon. You can follow all of this on Twitter through the hashtag, pound sign, Pace Food, P-A-C-E-F-O-O-D. And uh, go to Dot .earth as well, uh, D-O-T-E-A-R-T-H. Just Google for that and you'll find Dot .earth as well. Uh, here's Charlene Hogler, a biology professor at Pace University, who's going to kick things off. And there's a big audience here I'm going to show you briefly. All right, Charlene, it's over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're very, very pleased that you could join us today. Um, I'm going to very briefly go into the, um, uh, the genesis, the beginning of this wonderful project. And it's a project that is co-sponsored by SIGNSI, which is Scientific Research Society. Uh, it's an international society of science, over 60,000 scientists from over 100 different countries are participants, including, um, well, over the course of time, more than 200 Nobel laureates. The Sigma Psi organization is for science research and promoting science research. But their other important mission is science and society. And for that reason, we do a lot of outreach programs. And one of these wonderful programs is being presented today at Queen's University. This program is one that um, is, the, I guess, the joint brainchild of the Pace Academy and uh, the Dyson College uh, and maybe some of the other colleges of the university um, administration. They like to get students thinking and to promote challenging events that get the students thinking. So this event is on genetically modified organisms and the foods, both animal and plant foods, that have a very important part in our future. Remember, we're dealing with a planet that's going to have 9 billion people. And um, working around the logistics of 9 billion, feeding 9 billion people is um, an awesome type of endeavor. So with that said, uh, I want to thank the Pace Academy for spearheading this very important uh, food you design um, campaign. They're trying to demystify uh, the things that are related to GMOs, the ideas, the apps, and the future. Um, we also want to thank Andrew Redkin, our moderator, who reflects the very, very highest quality of public interest reporting. And we want to uh, thank our wonderful panel for sharing their expertise on the subject of GMOs and, of course, the support and encouragement of our Dyson administration. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Charlene. So just a, a quick additional word, Pace Academy for Applied Environmental Studies, which is where uh, several of us hang our hats, is um, an interdisciplinary hub on this campus designed to interlace the uh, efforts of the law school, the uh, undergraduate and graduate group. And yeah. we want to uh, thank our wonderful panel. That was interesting. Um, Anyway, the Pace Academy is, uh, is trying to kind of make sure that the different parts of Pace talk to each other and work together and collaborate in both learning and communicating about how to have a sustainable path to humanity in a very complicated, exciting <laughs> century. Um, so that's the story there. Um, now, I want to introduce you to our long distance panel before we get to um, the people who are in the room. Nathaniel Johnson, how long have you been at Christ? Sorry, since June. 
since since last June, right? And he's been writing about food um, from a vantage point that is uh, well. I'm gonna you'll hear. Um, it's fascinating. He dug in really hard for six months and created a, what I could, what I wrote in Don Earth was a prize worth a prize worthy um, package of ex examining the science behind all the heat you hear from both sides on genetically modified organisms as part of the food system. And he uh, he just did a great job of in a dispassionate way, looking at what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to learn, and uh, what that mix of information leaves society with. And it's kind of a murky result, as, as you'll, you'll hear. But some of the things that we've heard as sort of memes about uh, GMOs may not be as established as some people think they are. And Pam Ronald, uh, he's, uh, by the way, he's in Berkeley, California, in rainy Berkeley, finally. And Pamela yeah. Ronald is a geneticist uh, focused on plants and agriculture for a number of years. She's uh, she's written a great book with her husband, who's an organic farmer. What's his name again? Raul Adamchak. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And that book is called Tomorrow's Table, and it's highly recommended. I think it would be a great book to have in the pace of curricu the curriculum in, in many ways. Um, and Pam is um, she's just a really important voice uh, on the science behind the headlines. Now, here in the room, let me go back to that camera over here. We have uh, a newcomer to, pay to the PACE community at the far end, Jason Zemanski. Zarneski, Zarneski, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you can use the microphone. Jason is a distinguished professor of environmental law at the law school. And uh, what's the book that you co-authored that I, I cited on Dot Earth this morning? The title is really right on point about environment law. Oh, yeah, my new book is. Ah, uh, here we go. Food, agriculture, and environmental law, and uh, you know, help the law professors to find it in the course, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and and, and we, I know you've been focused on the labeling question, so we're going to get into the whole labeling GMOs question. And uh, finally, Shelly Boris, who is a friend of mine, full disclosure, uh, happy, happy to disclose. She's a neighbor also in Garrison, and she's a masterful uh, cook, and she is the uh, in charge of Fast Company. Uh, Fresh company, not fast company. Fresh company, which is a food uh, a catering service, but also is, is provides the food at the Garrison Institute, which is a marvelous place near us that focuses on the role of faith and religion and, uh, and having a sustainable human progress in this century. And she has cooked for, among others, the Dalai Lama. So, so she knows how to do her stuff and has a book, forthcoming book. Uh, also, fresh cooking and your recipes from the Garrison Institute. Great. So I thought we should start with the science um, and then move to Nathaniel. I will, I'd like to have Pam kind of just sort of deconstruct a little bit about the um, GMO, what those initials mean, and, and perhaps a little bit of the, the history of what we understand about how to use genes uh, technologically to move them around as a distinct way from breeding plants than what we used to do, which was to move genes around but through a through uh, more other means, and not not all of which are low low tech, and uh, including irradiating plants to create different traits. So Pamela, can you start out with just a quick primer on this whole what thing we call GMO? Sure. Uh, the term GMO stands for gen genetically modified organism, and I think that is one reason that there's so much difficulty having a discussion about this because, of course. Everything we eat is genetically altered in some manner. And I think the term GMO is, is very misleading because it sort of introduces this idea that we've only begun to genetically alter crops. And um, it's important to realize that we have been using other methods for, well, really 10,000 years. So 10,000 years ago, our ancestors used what's considered uh, to be primitive domestication, so saving seed, for example, and planting seed. And then about 300 years ago, more advanced methods of hybridization um, took, uh, began to take hold. And then, of course, uh, 150 years ago, we had Mendel. And at that point, it really, about 30 years after Mendel's discovery, basic discovery of plant genetics, it really launched what we consider modern plant breeding. And so what you find with modern plant breeding is that you can introduce specific traits uh, into crops using uh, man-made, human-made intervention. So 
1905, for example, Roland Biffin in Cambridge first began to introduce disease resistance genes into crops. Uh, he was able to show that you can make a cross between a resistant wheat and a susceptible wheat and the progeny will carry the genes for resistance. So this was a really um, huge advance and uh, now today virtually all the crops we eat carry these genes called resistance genes. Now in the last let's say 50, 100 years there have been more modern methods of, of plant genetics including as uh, Andy mentioned random immunogenesis where you take seeds, you dip them in a, a carcinogenic solution that um, introduces random mutations and then these are used in crossbreeding experiments um, and then the food that are derived from those are, are not carcinogenic that, that, but the, the genome has been changed so there's random mutations and then in the last 30 years there's been a new development uh, well it's not new anymore but genetic engineering where you can take a gene from any uh, species and put it in directly into a plant so for the last 20 years we've had for example cotton expressing a bacterial gene and this is um, a bacterial gene that allows the plant to be resistant to insects and it's a it's a protein widely used by organic farmers uh, and the reason that it's become so popular in the organic farming community as well as uh, for farmers that plant genetically engineered cotton is that uh, the plant itself can withstand uh, insect attack and so there are reductions in insecticides. Can, you, and uh, I, can I pause you there and just can you dig in a little bit more on that? So wait, or it sounds like you're saying organic farmers are using something that sounds like not very organic. Well How organic farmers, um, the one of the goals of organic farming is an integrated pest management strategy and um, the goal really is to reduce the use of sprayed synthetic chemicals um, but they are allowed to use other types of pesticides and one of the pesticides is called BT so what organic farmers do is they purchase a, uh, a bacteria that has been um, prepared in, in bats at, at a company and it's expressing a, a small toxin called BT and what they do is spray the dead bacteria containing this toxin on the plants and so geneticists have taken advantage of that approach and instead of spraying the bacteria on the plants they express only the active um, component directly in the plant so, so it's, it's can I stop you there? I want to actually bring in Nathaniel briefly just to, to weigh in on how that sort of illustrates the Merck factor here. When I say Merck, I mean societally, it seems to me that you know, we use these words like organic and GMO as brand labels, but you know, when you were doing your reporting, and could just tell them a little bit about the context and where you're coming from and doing your reporting, and, yeah. then, and then dive in on that question. So, um, I, I came to Grist um, because I think um, <clears throat> I had a sensibility that they were looking for. Where I was, I was, I'd grown up in a very, um, very all natural kind of setting, and I have a lot of, you know, I'm an environmentalist. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy for um, that suite of concerns of, of, about natural and organic, um, and I'm also a true believer in in the primacy of science, and so I, and I think these things can be married very, um, very nicely together. Um, and so, so this was my goal was to try and bring this approach to uh, the the whole genetically modified debate. And it, and my my editor was the one that had the idea. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, <laughs> so. Um, and so, yeah, there is this murkiness with, with things like BT. And just to be clear, uh, the BT that the organic farmers are spraying, they're using a bacteria. So they're using a critter that's already out there. And then when it's genetically modified, we're taking the, the genes from that critter and putting it into the plant. Um, and so, so there is a, an extra element of, of new technology there. Um, but at the same time, 
it's it's very very similar to what um, we normally consider to be healthy and natural and and just wholesome feels good um, and not scary at all. Um, so there so there there are these these ways that you can look at it and start to ask, um, you know, why does something feel feel more or less uh, threatening than than others? Well, that gets at the word in the title of the um, this event where feelings is in there. Feelings, facts, and uh, food, and technology, essentially. Uh, can you kind of run down a quick list of the biggest surprises to you, like personally, areas where you felt most challenged in, in either direction? Um, well, let me think. Uh, so I, w I was surprised. Um, the, the first thing that I, I looked at was was regulation because I um, I was I, I figured this is just a, a simple question I hear from one side that the genetically modified food is completely unregulated um, I hear from the other side that uh, that it's heavily overregulated uh, this is I, I'll just be able to find some some honest broker who can tell me what the deal is. Um, but it turned out to be an incredible rabbit hole to, to journey down because uh, because like this debate has just been going on for so long that, that all of these things, there's these talking points um, that are extremely far from the truth on, on both sides often. So with regulation, it turns out that that GMOs are heavily regulated, but it's a, a voluntary process, a legalistically voluntary process. But nobody has ever um, opted out of this voluntary process, so so it's it's, not, it's really not that voluntary. There's there are big repercussions if you do if you don't volunteer. Um, so that was a big surprise to me to to learn that 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 there there are some regulations. Um, what were the other surprises? Just that it was a real surprise to me to learn how much science there's been looking at the health effects and um, and how overwhelming that science is and how how much of that science has been done independently by um, big organizations really thoughtfully like the European Union and um, the National Academy of Sciences bringing in not just the reductive um, scientists but uh, big picture scientists as well and looking at environmental and health effects, you know, all of these questions had been um, had been sorted out time and time again, and it, so it really wasn't that hard to go back and look at, at the evidence there. So it was it was surprising that there was so much evidence uh, suggesting that um, the, the GMOs that we have don't pose uh, a health problem, in light of the fact that I was seeing one Facebook post after another about how um, they might be really problematic in terms of health. Okay. Um, I'd like to bring into this discussion the people who are physically sitting here. Uh, Jason, uh, we heard about regulation, and, and uh, that's your purview, the, the law. Um, so maybe you could weigh in a little bit on, on the evolution of this issue. Just a quick sketch of whether, and whether you perceive the way things are overseen, both for conventional and genetic agriculture is adequate. Well, let me first say it's impossible to give a, a quick sketch of, of the regulatory regime surrounding genetically modified foods. Um, but I'll do my best on the left, right? Um, the reason is there's no single uh, federal statute um, that deals with genetically modified organisms. It's not like the water, Clean Water Act, Air, Clean Air Act. That, that's just not the case. Instead, what you have is a coordinated framework amongst federal agencies, the USDA, uh, the FDA, and the EPA um, that deals with both animal, GMO plants and animals, dealing with everything from uh, pesticide restrictions to you know, GMO uh, animal treated as an animal drug because of the recombinant uh, the DNA, uh, the RNA, I'll the scientists probably can handle that question. Um, <laughs> In addition to other federal statutes uh, like the Plant Protection Act and our national uh, organic program, 
that so it is a, it is a large overlapping uh, 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 area for which no single federal agency has has authority. Um, I, I think the biggest challenge is that there's sort of two issues with that regulation. There's the production and processing side of that, which asks questions like, uh, uh, is this safe? Uh, is this organic? And genetically modified organisms cannot be labeled as that. They cannot be organic. And then, but then there's also a consumer side, which is that if you see the word uh, GMO free, is it really GMO? Should we mandate that company uh, label things as, as genetically modified? If you see the word organic, for example, on a product, it does not mean that it's 100% organic, unless it says 100% organic. And the only way you can guarantee that what you're eating does not contain genetically uh, modified organisms, it would have to say 100% organic. So different ways of using the term organic. So this is a very brief way of suggesting that um, the regulatory framework is, is not, they're not entirely sure what Nathaniel means by the word voluntary regulation. I think what he might mean um, is that it is definitely an industry-driven process where industry presents science and then can receive approval uh, for the use of a, a particular uh, a crop or organism or things like that. And so it's very much dependent on that science. And that is, a, is a, and I think it's correct in that there is a big difference between um, the United States where we have a very much a cost benefit uh, model. We sort of leap first before we look um, again, versus the European Union, which is definitely a more of a precautionary principle model. So thus the regulations for everything from genetically modified organisms to things like food additives and food coloring are much stronger in Europe than what you see in the United States. So a little bit more murk there too. Um, so Shelley, as a consumer of food, both as a chef and as an individual human being, uh, maybe you could weigh in a little bit when, you know, I'm sure you've struggled with this in trying to satisfy clients who um, want one thing or another in the food that you serve uh, or again just in your own general sense of what's best going forward. Uh, Shelley has a book coming out in June mm -hmm. called Fresh Cooking, Fresh cooking yeah. uh, that about a year of cooking at the Garrison Institute, again, which is kind of a hub for sustainability. So they're very careful about what they serve there. So just weigh in a little bit from the, from the recipient. Right. We, are, we are careful about what we serve there. I'm very careful about what I serve there. But we have a couple of different kinds of band-aids. And one is to make uh, good food affordable as well. Um, so that many people can model a way for people to eat well. We have a default menu of vegetarian food, but we don't cook exclusively vegetarian food. I actually personally kind of offered um, every three days if people are there long enough that I give them the opportunity to have a small amount of meat. Most people that come aren't vegetarians. Most of us cook there are not vegetarians. And, but we're forced by these certain limits, both budget and this idea that you know, it's a kind of a neutral position to so maybe be more vegetarian if you need a simpler diet. Um, forces us to think about ways to taste and um, just the way people eat. And what I've observed on both ends of the spectrum for myself, I have, you know, boys at home who want to eat massive amounts of meat. I have, you know, people who come who are nervous when they hear it's vegetarian. Other many people come who are scared that our food might be genetically modified, not organic, and it isn't all organic. And so really, in many ways, I'm here to hear the science and to try to hold down the fort um, to be, really, to listen to science to help you make decisions and not to be so um, influenced by everybody's feelings. Because feelings are what I hear so much, so, many, so much anxiety, so much stress. People put, you know, a lot of worry. They're concerned. They think whatever they eat maybe will just affect them in ways that seem sometimes exaggerated. Yeah. Well, this gets back to. I want to swing back to Nathaniel. Uh, and by the way, if you have questions, uh, get them ready. Uh, you can also tweet them. This includes people in the room. Just include pound sign pace food, and uh, they're going to be compiled. And Carolyn Craig, who's here somewhere. Is keeping track, and we're gonna, we are going to shift to question and answer mode, to question and question and explore mode um, soon. We'll probably dive back and forth a couple times before we're done. 
but Nathaniel, so this, this we circle back to the sort of question of feelings and facts. And this relates to a, a big body of work that I started to focus on more since about 2006. And this is not just related to GMOs, but nuclear power, uh, fracking, uh, the list of global warming. Yeah. The list goes on in terms of um, where you see people's people come to the same body of information and have completely different reactions depending on their physiology almost. Yeah. So can you can you kind of dig in from your standpoint again as someone who came at this with I guess I'd say a liberal kind of foodie yeah. uh, mindset. I should, say, I should say that you know when you when you ask me for surprises I I told you the things the things that were sort of more uh, pro GMO that I because that's what surprised me. I wasn't so surprised when I found things that um, ways in which GMOs uh, might be problematic. Um, and so that was that was sort of my bias going in. Um, but yeah, there's absolutely there's a large body of science on this um, that suggests that uh, you know we think that we're we're highly rational decision makers and we just look at the evidence and we make up our minds based on what that is but in reality um, we the emotions are driving the bus and and those are much more hardwired um, and it really it's you you've really got to spend kind of uh, a monastic amount of time studying the issue and and meditating on it to to change to shift those um, kind of fundamental Passionate uh, beliefs. So, uh, so it was really it, one of the things that was most surprising to me in doing this series was how um, how passionate people are about this and how venomous uh, <laughs> people were in in um, responding to the the pieces that I wrote. Um, there's it, it's it's not the sort of thing that um, I think you can expect to just have a have a conversation about and and change someone's minds based purely on the evidence. Um, that said, I mean I think that this this sort of thing is is useful um, to um, to to put more evidence out there and, and plant plant these seeds that perhaps minds minds could be changed by having a conversation about the, the facts. Uh, and I want to swing to Pam. Pam, uh, also, um, and actually, actually, before I do, Nathaniel, can you describe the reactions? Like, was this? Can you just? I don't mean go through your email, but but can you summarize a couple that really kind of from either from whatever standpoint? Uh, well, uh, just I. I mean, I was I I was sort of. Um, photoshopped in effigy, and uh, you know, the picture was made of me with with dark clouds of, of, of brimstone rising from around me, um, and uh, but but most and and you know uh, sources that I talk to usually when I talk to a source they're they're very polite. If I make a mistake, they'll let me know. If they disagree with something that I say, they'll they'll politely talk to me about it and see if I can do something else that, that more uh, clearly reflects the, the facts. Um, in this case, often when, when I talk to sources, if, if they didn't like something that I said, they immediately put out a press release, you know, and they, they went straight to um, kind of trench warfare tactics rather than, we're just all in this together, we're trying to figure this out as best we can. Um, so, so yes, that was bizarre. And then, of course, like, more attention than anything else I've, I've ever done. You know, this a lot of a lot of internet trolls, but also um, a, also a lot of people just being very interested. I mean, I think the one um, positive and hopeful thing from this experience was that it, it really felt like there is a a real thirst for um, some some less partisan information on this issue. Like, we've been getting slammed by such extreme statements um, that it's very hard to find what's actually going on. And, and, and people are, there are, some, there are some people who are really interested in, in learning what the real evidence is here. Uh, Pam, so Pam, I know you've probably dealt with more than your share of this kind of uh, 
dynamic as well. Now, as a scientist, I, and, and me as a science journalist for now 31 years, I know I spent most of my career assuming that if you just work on science and communicate it effectively, that everyone goes, aha, and we all move forward and progress evolves. But again, the social science says it's not like that. Did you have an aha moment like that? I did in the mid-2000s where I suddenly realized, oh my god, if I spend the rest of my career just writing more articles about science, that's not going to really change things. Uh, did you have a sort of oh, oh no or aha moment? Yeah, definitely. Um my husband and I have been in these discussions for many years. We've lived in Davis together for nearly 20 years uh, because he's an organic farmer and I'm a geneticist. Uh, over those years it became a very sort of hot topic of conversation and there had been newspaper articles written uh, that we felt did not reflect um, the actuality of what farmers do or what geneticists do. So we thought, oh, well, we'll just write this book, and um, then everything will be perfectly clear to everybody. Um, you know, very practical, based in science, based in farming. Um, my husband wasn't quite as naive as, as I, but I, I did truly think that, oh, there's a lack of information. And of course, as we all know, um, as, as Nate so eloquently explained, it's, it really brings up a lot of emotions in people. And I think what keeps uh, us going, those of us that um, do try to convey uh, the science-based information, is that there, as Nate again said, there are truly, uh, most people are truly very interested. They truly want to know. But there is a loud voice out there. Um, and I, I think there really are these things called GMO opponents, and they're all over the internet. But I think it's not accurate to say, GMO proponents. And the reason I say that is because those that advocate um, for uh, advancing food security and advancing sustainable agriculture um, using the best farming methods and the best, best science um, are really uh, farmers, agriculturalists, scientists, environmentalists, ecologists that are looking at the broader goals of advancing sustainability and how do you do that. And so we're not bogged down in sort of this idea that one technology is good and one technology is bad. We're very interested in advancing sustainable agriculture and food security using any safe technology that's out there. And so for us scientists and plant biologists, we, we don't even use the term GMOs this, GMOs that, because it's it's almost meaningless. Uh, you really need to talk about the particular crop, the particular trait, the consumer. You need to look who it benefits and how it fosters um, more sustainable agriculture in, ter in terms of uh, reducing um, toxic inputs, for example. So I think that's one big divide where you have sort of this activist GMO opponent mentality but when people talk about the other side, the other side really is a large collection of scientists, farmers, ecologists, environmentalists that are steeped in agriculture and are really concerned about those greater challenges. And I'm afraid that gets lost in a lot of these sort of Twitter feeds, I'm GMO pro, I'm GM GMO uh, against. Um, and so that's something I really hope that we will see more of a sophisticated conversation about agriculture and I believe one of the main problems is that farmers are, since there's only 1% of farmers in the United States, for example, there's not many farmers actually in the discussion. So many of these so-called panels are, are activists, and uh, you very, very rarely hear anybody ask a farmer, why are you growing genetically engineered crops? Um, because farmers are the people that are growing the food, and they really need to be involved in the discussion, I think. It, can I just say quickly? I mean, yeah. I think we should just acknowledge also that there are, on the on the pro side, there are people with a, a real vested interest. You know, there there are people whose job it is to promote genetic and modified food as well, and, and they don't always declare themselves. But but Pam is absolutely yeah. right that there's a large body of scientists and farmers. Farmers are very important to talk to. Yeah, um, and I agree um, with uh, Nate. Of course, there. Are uh, are large seed companies that have a commercial interest in selling their seed. There's no doubt about that and absolutely we need to disclose 
financial interest. Uh, but I think if you if you take the commercial interest out of it, out of the discussion completely, and just speak to those that are either using the technology, which are farmers, or scientists that are studying the technology, um, you can uh, have a very, very interesting and informative uh, discussion without even worrying about uh, potential um, commercial interest clouding the, the debate. And, and it's not that all that um, obviously the companies need to sell uh, their seed and so they have a, a clear interest in supporting the idea that technology is safe, but at the same time um, they have a clear interest in being sure that technology is safe because farmers are going to no longer buy the seed if there's any uh, any evidence that there's any harm to human health or the, or the environment. So uh, I want to go back at the what I would call the Monsanto effect. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. You know, what, has uh, there been kind of a toxification of the whole question when you get a company that has been accused of so many sort of dominating kind of practices? How much does that matter in, in sort of torquing the whole conversation? You, where you get people who are mainly anti-corporate, who end up sort of pushing the, the, the idea that GMOs are a disaster. Uh, but we'll get back to that in a minute. And we're also going to talk about labeling for sure. And, and that's going to swing back to, to Jason. But there's one thing I wanted to swing back to you for, Pam, which was this, this love story between an organic farmer and a genetic plant geneticist. Could you just tell, tell us a little bit about your, your husband? And then what did, do you have, did, did, did this start as dinner table arguments or, or questions? Uh, just so just give us a little view of that because I think it's really important. The human this gets back at the feelings and facts thing. You know, how have you worked that out together? It's, obviously, people can read the book tomorrow's table, but just give us a little snippet of that. Well, I think you know, in some sense. So we wrote this book, and so now we're considered unusual because these are polar opposites of the agricultural spectrum. But actually we don't really think it's that unusual because we both have the same goal which is an ecologically based agriculture and and truly we both chose our professions because of our love of plants our love of agriculture our love of food and um, and we met in you know Davis is kind of a farming kind of town and we met on my husband's farm organic farm um, I've worked on an organic farm and I think what's also very important is my husband has a science background he's um, <laughs> And also, he has studied um, agricultural development at UC Davis and entomology. So he has um, he understands sort of the critical thinking uh, behind science, and he really chose organic farming for very good reasons. And he's still an organic farmer because there is no doubt that we need to advance the sustainability of our farming system. Um, but he also is open to scientific methods. Um, and as an as organic farmer, I should say that all organic farmers um, buy commercial seed. So as a farmer, farmers are very, very knowledgeable about uh, the use of seed. And so if you, if you, when you speak to farmers, including organic farmers, they spend a lot of time looking for new seeds and are very open to technology. Because as a farmer, it's a, it's a practical profession. And um, you need to use the best tools, but of course you need to keep in mind the ultimate goals. And so we, when we wrote the book, we thought, okay, we can try to draw out some differences, and then we can have a, a discussion about our differences. But any time a new issue came up, we would both look at this independently, and every single time we came to the same conclusion. Um, and I really do believe that although it is, uh, as Nate said, sometimes difficult to get accurate information. If you, if you put the time into it, or you reach out to the, to, to the correct people, um, the, well, I shouldn't say correct people, but people that have knowledge about the science and knowledge about farming, you will be able to get an answer. Uh, but again, you have to ask specific questions. You cannot ask the questions, are GMOs good, are GMOs bad? You really need to ask a question, a specific question, for example, does genetically engineered papaya um, benefit uh, low-income farmers in Hawaii? And if so, why? And it, are genetically engineered papayas safe to eat? So you need to really look at a, a specific question. And I think the confusion is that the questions are so broad and, and the statement's so grand that 
we can't make progress unless we're we're really very specific. That's invaluable. I want to I want to actually go to Jason and talk about you know like it sounds like a clean water act approach wouldn't work here in that sense. A clean sort of a, and this issue of the USDA versus the FDA. Which could you see if you were the grand czar of keeping people safe in a, in a world heading toward nine billion people? Could you see a legal approach here and or labeling? Well, now let's talk about labeling. That, that actually is rational and, and would make things uh, work? So, so I think, you know, as, as I said before, and as you just mentioned, Andy, that you know, the challenge is that there isn't a single statute that deals with GMOs. Um, we could do that. Uh, we, could, we could do that with, with, with uh, climate crisis as well. Um, I'm skeptical that Congress will pass a statute either about specifically about genetically modified organisms or about the climate crisis. And I think I have good reason to be skeptical in that the major environmental statute has been passed in the last few years. Um, so uh, you know, in that way, I think an analogy one could use is what's going on with, with climate change, that we're sort of trying to fit uh, a, a square peg into a round hole, or someone saying, well, you know, maybe an older peg into a round hole. You know, we're, we're trying to regulate greenhouse gases. Through uh, the Clean Clean Air Act, um, and maybe that's okay. And 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 um, you know, I don't think Congress maybe was aware of climate change at the time. But you know, it, it's a challenge, right? It's a new thing. The and Supreme Court was just kind of deliberating on some aspects exactly. of that two days ago. Exactly. And and so I think you know, at least as as the as the federal statutory regime is currently constructed, we need to ask ourselves how can we how can the existing agencies that have this coordinated Work together and and regulate GMOs to the full extent of their statutory ability. Now, to, to this day, USDA, FDA, and EPA have not, at least in my view, um, if you look at the language of the various statutes that are relevant, sort of extended their jurisdictional to as, as far as they possibly can. And I and I can use labeling as an example. So, the FDA has the ability to approve or not approve GM animals that might be uh, used for human consumption. And there's the, the big issue right now is that one of the big issues is aqua bounty and it's genetically modified salmon. It's, uh, it's a Chinook salmon, which uh, has in the salmon they've inserted the, the, the gene of an ocean pout, the eel-like uh, 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 fish, as to uh, increase the uh, speed of its, of its growth. And so the EPA has argued that so long as it's not material, materially different, and so long as it's safe for human consumption, it just needs to be on the market and it need not be labeled. What I, I view is their, their reading of the statute is narrow, that this in fact just because uh, if you taste, you know, taste like a salmon and it is a salmon, that you know it's not materially different. I actually think it is materially different. It's not a salmon, it's something else. I don't know what it is, but it's not a salmon. <laughs> it's a salmon with a new gene, and therefore FDA actually does have the legal authority to require labeling. So it's an issue of statutory interpretation of what you do. So there's an example of where the regulatory agencies are going to, are, are really a political issue about how far they can go in regulating uh, these genetically modified uh, animals and crops. Other people think that we should use the Plant Protection Act. So I think you know the statutory regime uh, will get there, but there needs to be some some public pressure. In that way, I'm a little bit optimistic. Um, uh, I still think it's true that the uh, organic guidelines uh, receive more comments than any other proposed rulemaking in the history of the United States. So it's really interesting how people are, are much more interested in their food sources than they fear. If I would have told my class 10 years ago, how many of you are interested in food and agriculture issues, none of you would raise your hand. Now, half the class will, um, and whether that's because uh, Michael Pollan wrote a very popular book, or uh, whether um, I still think it's true that our food is probably the closest to nature we ever are on our daily basis. That might be a reason. But I think people have a have a new new interest, and people are nervous about these technologies. So I think I think it would be interesting to see if through the administrative state and the increased power of the executive branch, whether we see uh, progress uh, in the regulatory agencies through our. So let's, let's dig in a little bit on labeling, and then I am going to open up to questions. I think there's some from Twitter, at the very least. Um, and then uh, we'll swing through some of these other topics we've got lined up. Thanks uh, for your 
attention. Yeah, everyone seems pretty focused, which is good, even though it's lunchtime. Uh, so labeling. You know, some of the uh, early initiatives in labeling, like the California proposition and Washington State, one of the key criticisms of them was that they were clearly designed to be punitive, not just informational, meaning uh, a warning, essentially, uh, as opposed to what you were talking about, which seems to be you know, more, this fish has, it's, it's not quite a salmon. But it's a fish, and we don't see anything to use that. Is it, how problematic is, is that? When I was writing about those initiatives on Dot Earth. I was very critical of them, even though a lot of people. And I did say, like to me, in a perfect world, absolutely, we should have we should have transparency and knowledge, of, of knowledge of communicating. Um, but I, I, every time I've seen an effort come forward, it always ends up with a twerking. You know, people really want this like radiation style label as opposed to, and then of course when you look at the California initiative, it had all these out clauses. Dairy was not included. So could you just dig well, in on that example? Issue? Like, you know, it was a question of whether the FDA had the ability to, to mark things as radiated. They recognized that statute in that case that, oh, that, that is perhaps different. You have the ability to do that. I mean, there's other cases, uh, you know, the Vermont case and, and RBGH uh, in the milk, and, and that was struck down by the courts because the idea was there that it was just about consumer awareness and not about any particular health concerns, and the state legislature didn't make particular health concerns uh, part of the claim. You know, the, the labeling debate uh, as it relates to GMOs uh, are, are, are multifaceted. One is, is this more than about consumer awareness, but also about public health? And the science is in both places on that. Um, I think one of the, at least for me, one of the persuasive aspects of science is, is the question of allergy. Uh, could someone be potentially allergic to a new gene from a different organism? Right? Imagine putting a shrimp gene in something, right? with allergy and things like that. Um, there are also constitutional concerns, which I, I don't, I don't, I don't view as particularly strong. I mean, I think you know, for some, from the forty thousand foot level, um, the big challenge with labeling right now. Is if, you, if you go to the grocery store, everything is labeled. It's like a green orgy of labels. I mean, every, all natural, organic, green this, green that. What do we have? And so you have three different, really, bodies of labels. One are your, your, your government sponsored labels, like our organic label. The other is you have a third party certification, say, like the Marine Stewardship Council does with fish. And then the other, uh, which is actually a, a new sort of cutting edge issue is our, our self-declared company thing, which is, you know, I have a company, and my company makes widgets. And let me tell you, all my widgets are green certified. <laughs> and who certified them? I did. Okay? And so there are issues there with consumer fraud and consumer protection, and you're seeing uh, a lot of statutes in uh, state law actions as a result of consumer fraud protection. My, there's no question uh, that uh, state labels have gravitas and they have cachet. You see that in the US uh, DA organic logo. You see that in the Blue Angel logo in Germany. You see that in the Krav logo in Sweden. Uh, uh, the, you're not saying the Krav, but that's my second example, which is a third party certification that's well known, like the Krav logo in, in, in Sweden. Like, Could you just say what that is? Krav, it's K R A V. Uh, Krav, um, unlike in the United States, where our organic labeling uh, is governed through production prop, uh, processes as dictated through federal law, in Scandinavia, the organic labels are third party certified. Uh, so they're not government entities. And uh, so they are third party certifiers that work with individual companies and producers and processors to get that label. So they have an entrenched uh, reputation like our organic labor. So they're older because the country are much older. Um, what's interesting about Krav in particular, uh, I, you know, there, I, somebody, you know, at Krav, I don't know if they have a Twitter account, right? Um, what's interesting about that is their new logo is It Means More, which is not only are they taking an organic standard, but they're adding other things into it. Um, uh, like the carbon footprint of, of an organ, uh, of, of an item. So take a tomato. A tomato could be declared organic, but now if that tomato was uh, produced in a hot house, that house house that hot house uh, would be fueled by non-renewable energy, you no longer carry the organic logo. So one of the things I've often wondered about is why don't we take our organic logo that has a particular cachet and make it organic plus? 
uh, make it include some of our other environmental uh, considerations that we might see. And, and we see that in other ways, right? Fair trade, and there are other things you might think about. But I think we could do a, a lot to help the consumer and reduce consumer confusion, um, but clearly there's not a lot of um, political will right now. Well, one thing, maybe uh, others, uh, including remotely, might want to weigh in on this. Uh, there already is, as you were saying, there's the option to just label it yourself, just say you're GMO free. And uh, so why, why isn't that sufficient? Uh, if you were Shelly Boris planning a meal and your client says, you know, we really don't want this, um, then at least you can go where you go. And then there's a socioeconomic issue here. You know, it is more costly for the most part to have some of these partitioned um, things. And so should everyone, should, should there be a standard that's the... Well, the producers of, of, of genetically modified foods will argue that that's that by allowing people to say GMO free, that things but they're already doing it like Cheerios, you know, they just uh, even though oats is there's no GMO oats, right, Pam? So it makes it easy to say GM Cheerios are GMO free. But but they you know they can say that now at least. So. <coughs> the, mar the market is enormous. I mean, there's a, there's a particular irony here, right? Which is your largest your largest agribusinesses and food producers in the country are buying the organic producers. And so those are now subsidiaries of much larger companies because it's a huge market. There's a, I, I was a professor at Michigan State that has this wonderful graph of all the, the, the green circles and how they've been bought up by all the much, by the much larger circles. Even Coke. Coke would love to produce an all-natural, organic diet Coke. It would make a fortune, right? Um, if somebody can find, whether it's Stevie or something else, uh, you know, the, the thing for the all-natural, organic sugar, and items they make, they would, they would make a force. There'd be a huge market for it. And there's a recent article in Times, you know, related to this as well. So, so there is a market there, and I think so that's one of the, the ironies that large companies buy up. And the other thing is, while we might be concerned with industrial organic and the, the processing and distribution and over tilling that results, you know, we also want people to have access to safe, healthy, good food. So maybe that's a good thing. Like they would, in some Scandinavian countries, they would think that as, as a good thing. And the other thing is, I would rather have my child eat a conventionally grown apple with pesticides than some organic potato chips. Um, and there's, there's, so there's a nutritional component to, to this too that, that, that can't, can't be can't missed. I guess I, the, the last thing I'd like to say is that and there's a certain irony here that you know, the way our grandparents and great grandparents saved money was by making food all natural from scratch. And that, you know, that's how they did it. And then following the war, everybody wanted convenience. But now to be able to have the, the, the time to cook your own food and to be able to afford to buy all natural ingredients, especially from a place like Whole Foods or things like that, that's now an affluent thing to do. And that's, that's, that's very challenging to do. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of parts to this as well. And a lot of people just don't know how to cook. Yeah. Um, home ec my kids think it's amazing that I had home economics in the 7th grade. <laughs> you learn to make cookies. You know how to sew. Yeah, um, and that's not part of our educational process. And so you wonder about victory garden, garden in the classroom. And things like that. How, how does that become part of our educational process as well? So if anything, I view this conversation and all these students here. Like this is comfort. Like we're getting back to something that was good. Well, and, it, and it's all about learning where stuff comes from, which I think is invaluable. So Shelley. Yeah. As a cook, get into the, the mix. In a way, there are questions, maybe there'll be a uh, question that some of the students have, and maybe they'll just like float in everybody's mind and they'll answer in one way or another. One is um, that sometimes it feels like feeding people and affordability and then flavor and good food are can be at odds. I mean, we can all agree that we can make great dry beans and make great dry beans taste good, and I'm a kind of my uh, interest is in making delicious and affordable food. I also think about the unforeseen consequences of like um, all of the science because sometimes I think about books and how books can be only very few people used to have books and they were hand you know illustrated and they were made of beautiful things and only a few people have them and now we can all have books and we can all read and we can all have our computers. So I wonder if I notice that tomatoes get better, you know, not absolutely tomatoes get better and better and better. And if they'll end up with like more people being able to afford B plus tomatoes, but 
the A plus commitment will just go away, you know, and it's fine. In the same way that if we don't need so much farmland and we can feed everybody where we not have, you know, big open landscapes. Sometimes the unforeseen, you know, consequences of the good side of science, and uh, just I guess it's just really a question. And um, my other question was to maybe somebody during the course of this discussion could talk about what are some of the you know worst years that any of these scientists think could be true? Because there's the immediate need to eat and be safe, and then there's like what, you know what 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 could happen? What is out there? In the smallest chance that people are afraid of, because people talk about safety, but I don't know if people know what they're what are they afraid of. You know, what is their view of their you know, specifically? Great. So, Nathaniel, I'd love to swing back to you, um, and then we will actually move for the questions. Um, any any quick thoughts on the labeling thing? You're in California, yeah. as, as is as is uh, Pam, and then uh, and on this issue, uh, basically the issues that Shelley posed. Yeah. So. Um, but just just a couple of quick notes. You know, one is that the, the third party labeling thing is interesting, and, and that's already happening in the in the U.S. There's this non-GMO project that's um, uh, working on that, and, and you can see their labels on a bunch of uh, a bunch of different foods in the in the marketplace. If you look, um, the thing about labeling, you know, at this point in the U.S. What we've decided to do for um, for GM food is to regulate it based on the actual ingredients um, and what we know about those ingredients, rather than regulating it based on the process by which it's made. Um, and so, if it's if it's made via uh, genetic modification, we'll ignore that. Um, if if the ingredients look uh, identical to something that's not made by genetic modification. And there, there are some uh, arguments for um, labeling based on process. This is, you know, organic food, you could argue, is, is a label that's based on the process rather than the, um, the end product at times. Um, but then the question becomes, you know, it gets back to that issue of what do we rate what do we label? You know this profusion of, of labels, and if we're going to label based on process, you know, I think there are some some really important issues that we should be uh, looking at, like um, farm workers' rights. You know, how how many people were abused? Uh, how many people inhaled organophosphates? You know, in the fields to create this and and bring it down. Um, animal welfare. Uh, Climate impact, all of these things that you know, I, I'd love to see like a lead, you know, a lead silver uh, label on my food. You know, it's how 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 well was this produced? But you can see this. There's a profusion here. Um, yeah. But the I, I thought a lot about labeling because I, you know I'm in California. Um, I I wasn't enmeshed in this reporting when the um, when the vote happened, and I voted for labeling in California, and then it, it went down in uh, in Washington, and it was very a very similar statute with just a few um, a few things tweaked, and um, and that basically the same thing happened. It, it, the food companies spent a lot of money. People learned more about it and decided not to um, approve it there. Um, I, I tend to think that, that labeling might be a good thing because it would just um, it would it would cure some of this fear that we have around genetically modified food. You know, it's this we have this massive looming fear of the unknown. You know, what is this? So unless you're a scientist or have been enmeshed in the science, it's really hard to tell what exactly we're talking about here. And if you put a label on it. And you have the option of saying, "Okay, I can just I can just opt out of this, um, or I can see it's there, and I can see it's in all these things that I've been eating for 15 years, and it's not a not been a problem for me." I think that might uh, relieve some of the fear. That's certainly the experience that I've had. You know, in California, we have another um, labeling. It's kind of a silly labeling where um, anything that 
has the slightest indication that it may cause um, some cancer in, if you give you know a thousand pounds of it to one rat. It has to have a label that says this this is known by the state of California to contain ingredients that may cause cancer. Um, so you have these labels in Starbucks and you know everywhere, um, and it just kind of it, I think. In my experience, what that did for me is I started to realize, you know, that there are chemicals all over that have, you know, some slight indication of, of harm, and and it, it kind of cured me of my um, my chemical phobias and and made me take a harder look at, at the science. So I, I'm I'm interested in um, labeling as kind of an uh, education tool. Yeah, I, I, I've said the same thing. David Ropik, who's a risk consultant, communicator, who's often sides with businesses, also said the same thing. I wrote about it in my daughter. If there is a way to do it in a way that's not clearly warning, warning, Will Robinson, um, it, just so where it's information, I think people would realize that. Uh, I don't know, Pam. I, Pam, I would like to get back to you, but I want to get to questions. So if you can hold any thoughts, unless you're, you know, something in your needs to come out right now, let's go to questions. That's okay. So um, I'm going to turn the camera to the room. Um, Carolyn, are there any things coming from Twitter to start us off with? Uh, yeah, yeah, just if you can share a mic. Uh, if you can keep this. Oh. Okay. Um, from Twitter, we have Patrick, Patrick Keyes at Water Security. Have GM crops been given enough opportunity to demonstrate their potential, or are we too early criticizing the tech? And I see some people responding, comparing it to coal and cigarettes and other things that we gave time to. You know, for me, the question would be time to do what, right? So there are two issues I think would be across. One is, have we given them enough time to uh, sort of solve the food crisis, right? The idea was that with the Green Revolution, we could feed everyone and have GM crops and solve the food crisis. But with a lot of leaders in the African countries, have, have sort of uh, pushed back against GM crops, um, and instead we have other environmental concerns like uh, super weeds and things like that. So one is the, 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 the food side of that. The other is the public health side. And so maybe I, I think that the data is a little bit concerning on the environmental side. Um, the public health side, I think the science is, is still is still developing. So I would I would I would defer to the, to the scientists on that, that question. But I would say that um, in that way, it's not a science question. It's a policy question. And the question is, is in the face of risk, should we proceed forward, knowing that there might be costs, unclear how big, or should we pause and not? Depending on, this, you know, depending on how we do that cost-benefit calculus, we may make different decisions. Well, that gets back to that whole divide between the precautionary approach that Europe favors and um, and another approach. Pam, do you want to weigh in on this this issue of uh, the science on the health side? Either? Sure. I think all these questions are interrelated about labeling and the science. Um, and the the science is is clear. Um, and there's there's no question on the last 20 years of the the crops that we've grown for 20 years. So. For example, there is absolutely no scientific uncertainty that the genetically engineered papaya have um, saved the papaya industry and that these papayas uh, yield massively more amounts of papaya than any other method. And, and in this sense, it's an appropriate technology because there's no other method to control a very devastating disease, which is a viral infection of papaya. And the other point I want to make there, it's clearly safe because the genetically engineered papayas contain trace amounts of the virus, whereas uh, if you look at it, for example, an organic papaya it has massive amounts of the, the virus. Well, the virus doesn't hurt anybody. It's, a, it's um, a plant virus. It doesn't infect human beings, but it's very damaging to the crop. And so, um, and there's also uh, very clear evidence if you look at cotton that there's been massive reduction in very toxic insecticides, not only in the United States, but in India and in, and in China. And I think um, this is, is uh, so I have a slide that I often show. It's like every scientific organization that has looked at this has come to the same conclusion. Um, each crop has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. 
but there are clear uh, evidence of benefits. Um, and I, th I believe this is related to the labeling because we all want to know if our food is safe for, to eat. We all want to know if we can somehow purchase food to reduce the amount of toxic uh, uh, compounds in the environment. Um, and we all want um, transparency and information. But the irony of some of the GMO labeling uh, ideas is that um, there was a really, for example, there was a really great um, story on NPR with Dan Charles, and there's a whole movement now to grow GMO-free corn and GMO-free um, uh, soybean and GMO-free uh, other crops. And he interviewed the farmers. Well, how is it going? And they say, well, we've got a great, great consumer demand. And they say, well, how do you do it? How do you grow these GMO-free products, they say, well, what we do is we return to older herbicides and older insecticides that are more expensive and more toxic, and we have lower yields. And so this idea of going back to old technologies that are less environmentally uh, sustainable is, is really problematic, and I think that is really what th that needs to be on uh, the label, and I agree with Nate, we need sort of a LEEDS uh, certified standard because uh, consumers that are buying these uh, so-called GMO free products, they don't even, uh, sometimes don't understand that they're advocating for going back to older technologies that are clearly uh, more toxic. And so I think as a scientist and a farmer, we get very frustrated about these things because we want the consumers to have absolute transparent information. And I, I th also thought a lot about this. And um, I think what we need is sort of a barcode. So if you buy that um, organic papaya and you compare it to the genetically engineered papaya, that the consumer will know right away that the organic papaya has a lot more of this viral um, protein and of the virus itself and that um, that the farmer has to use ten times more land to produce the same amount of fruit and and it's not that the virus is going to hurt you but at least that's real information if you slap a GMO label on there the consumer is actually not getting the the real information that they want and so it's it's a real uh, a really confusing issue and I think uh, it's really important that we do address this. But there's there's a, there's a couple of things that that you said, which I think you know need additional discussion and clarification. So one is there's no doubt that you know perhaps genetically modified plants are good for the plants, but right? there's the issue of, of creating genetically modified plants as a way to sell uh, pesticide, make make those crops pesticide resistant. Existed around a ready problem. The other is what are the effects of genetically modified plants on on public health? Whether that's you know I've read stuff about you know protein modifications and uh, things that can you know, do bizarre things to your immune system and rats. So that's the other thing. Well, I, it's one thing to have a that's GMO free. The, the other on the labeling point is that you know an organic label, you know it's 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 free of genetically modified organisms, and you know it didn't use pesticides. Mm -hmm. So you're right. There might be absolutely land use concerns, but you know, I would, uh, you know, the science. I'm less comfortable making the argument, but at least on 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 that point, I'm comfortable. That you get a net environmental benefit buying the organic over the non-organic product, even though the, the public health uh, uh, data isn't isn't quite as certain. Well, absurd. I I would like to comment, in, and I hear that um, quite a bit. That kind of uh, concern, but what I would like to point out is that you're kind of again mixing up this idea of GMOs um, and you it's really not you not we can't have a discussion that way because you really need to be specific so you can look at so for example genetically engineered papaya is not engineered to spray any herbicide at all and so genetically engineered papaya is simply it's, it's sort of um, conceptually similar or it's mechanistically different than a human vaccine. So we're all vaccinated for smallpox, polio, these diseases are virtually wiped out on the planet and it's because we've taken uh, vaccines. So these papayas are vaccinated with trace amounts of a mild strain of the virus that allows them to be grown um, uh, virtually free of the virus. And so 
Um, and again, there's no food safety issue because you actually have less of this foreign organism uh, in there. So you have to be, I think, really, it's really important to be very specific. And then if you look at the herbicide tolerant crops, that's also, it's a very complex and very interesting interesting issue. These are crops that are engineered um, to withstand uh, Roundup, which is a, an herbicide, a fairly modern herbicide. It's, it's been used in the last, I don't know, 20, 20 years. Um, and the reason farmers have shifted to Roundup is because it's much less toxic than conventional herbicides. Um, and so one could certainly argue that Farmers should not use herbicides. I don't want to spray anything on my crop. And, and that is a completely legitimate argument. But it's very difficult to achieve. So 99% of farmers in the United States use herbicides because weeds are, are very problematic um, for growing food. Um, and I think, again, to, to mix up those issues is, is a problem because it's not the technology that creates any problem or health problem. It's actually what people are concerned about is the herbicide. So it would be more sense scientifically to uh, ban herbicides rather than to say, well, we must ban all kinds of genetic engineering because I don't like herbicides. And so as a scientist and a plant biologist and, you know, in a farming community, um, we, we really uh, want people to be very specific about their concerns because then we can work together as a group to figure out how to advance food security and advance sustainable agriculture. So I'm sure we can go in the, we can go back on that for, for, a time, for a while, but I'd like to get some more questions before we, and then we can engage back on that question. That's okay. Um, so my name is Melody, and I'm an environmental studies major. And um, through all my studies, the past four years, I've been learning that. Can you stay there? Yeah, sure. You're on camera. <laughs> Uh, I've been learning that it's more a problem of, uh, like, I know in um, third world countries, it's a problem of hunger. And, Hold on one second. Yeah. Can you guys mute your microphones? Oh, sorry. I hear it. I think, yep. Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, for the future, and this is just a general question, would the focus be more on fair distribution of food? Because I've learned, or maybe I've interpreting this wrong, but that we do have enough food in the world for everybody, but that is just not distributed fairly. And so would the future be focused more on GMOs? Because um, from Pamela, what she's saying, the papaya, how it's actually um, beneficial. So um, science more towards that, or a focus on fair distribution of food resources? Interesting question. Any quick thoughts on that from any of you? Uh, uh, I, I can make uh, a quick comment. I want to leave time for the other speakers is that it's a really important question and really we want to advance food security and and in the less developed countries we need to advance local food security because farmers um, in those countries, consumers in those countries don't always have access to fresh food. Um, the, the farmers themselves often don't have uh, an easy way to distribute the food and get it to the cities. Uh, so you need to uh, empower the farmer to grow their food themselves. We can't, you know, ship in food from all around the world. So this concept of local food security is really very important in the less developed countries. And so there's huge um, major efforts around the world to advance, for example, um, cassava, uh, banana, rice, and other staple food crops that the, the farmers in these countries can grow them without the added use of insecticides, herbicides, which often they cannot afford anyway. They don't have access. Often there's very poor soil fertility, so there's major efforts to try to um, develop crops that can utilize nitrogen more efficient, efficiently. And so I think that's what we're going to see more and more of that. And of course, that's the area I work in. I work on rice. And uh, just this week, we published a paper on banana, which is uh, susceptible to a very devastating bacterial disease. Um, and banana is a staple food for 100 million Africans. There's no method to control this disease. So we have been working with um, scientists in Kenya to develop bananas that can withstand uh, uh, this type of uh, biological stress. Um, and so these are the kinds of approaches that I think are really going to be very, very important. 
just before we go to the next question, which is queued up here, um, I want to get Nathaniel to jump in quickly. You know, one one thing that I think is a, a concern is industry has so long asserted we're going to solve the world's hunger problems. We're going to come up. We're going to develop for you a climate a drought resistant X, Y, and Z. And that there have been many unfulfilled promises there. That golden rice is still kind of a someday thing, and that it, or it's like a Trojan horse, basically. It's, it's kind of like GM doing 1% of its fleet as electric cars a long time ago. Um, what do you think about that? Is that is, it, is industry not, or science, not sold you on the prospect that it's really serious about doing some of the things that Pam was talking about? I think, that, I think the scientists are serious, and um, I, don't, I don't know about the industry. Um, you know, the scientists, they're all these scientists like Pam who are dedicating their lives to this um, because they really do believe it can help. And I think, you know, I think that when we try and solve these problems, we have to use a lot of different tools to try and solve them. Um, and, um, and genetic engineering may be one of those tools. With the case of golden rice, if everything works out, um, the, the amount of money that we put into it will be a very small investment because it, it'll, it, it could fix the problem. It may not work out. You know, people may not um, want to eat golden rice. You know, any more than um, they'd want to eat some other uh, vitamin A containing uh, vegetable that they could plant right now. So, um, I, I do think that there there has been an over emphasis on um, on technological solutions, and um, you know, pro often the the real Solutions are um, the really frustrating political solutions of getting in there and, and solving the problems of, of corruption and figuring out how to lift people out of poverty. And these, these things are exasperatingly hard. Um, and it's, it's, in some ways, it's easier to um, engineer a new form of rights. And that's why that's so, so attractive. But, um, but I think sometimes the technology is a little more seductive than um, we're, we're a little bit more seduced than we should be. That's a good point. Uh, so let's get that next question. Say who you are, if you can keep it short. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm a uh, local resident, but I'm also a master gardener and have a vested interest in, in this discussion. But my question is, um, maybe from a bigger standpoint. Mute your mic back there. We talked about the Roundup Ready um, GMOs, mainly what I'm thinking of is corn. And we're talking about sustainable agriculture for food. But what about you know many of the large farms converting or their, their fallow fields, their habitat that is now being destroyed to grow corn for ethanol? And do we have more of an ethical question to address that we should not be destroying habitat and the biodiversity in our country, just to create just food is one thing, but ethanol for large companies is another. Well, this relates to yeah. Uh, there are these layers to this issue. In other words, there's the the direct question on a farm, whether it's in Hawaii or wherever. Then there's the, ener the in impact of energy policy on driving the, the uh, corn production in the Midwest such that there's no room for milkweed. I think is what you're talking about. So, which is uh, essentially not a GMO question. It's a uh, Energy policy question to, from from one. It can be a GMO problem. Well, it's GMO is the way the farmers satisfy the mandate that we have societally said you need to grow more corn, whether it's for cheap cereal or for to put in your car with a gas tank. Um, so you know that gets at this issue of your, your, these kind of concentric circles. Um, and I don't know whether Jason, you want to weigh in on that. I mean, I, I actually it's a land. Uh, I read an article a couple years ago where it said. Land use is the bastard child of environmental law. The idea that, like, you know, at the end of the day, right, we're talking about how we use the physical, you know, uh, land that really, if my, my, my second grade speech was uh, buy land now, God's not making it anymore. And, um, you know, what, if, what, should we, what should we do with our land, right? You know, we can, we can, not build, you know, if you go, they're all monocultures, and now you can rid of monocultures for a different type of monoculture, or we're cutting down rainforest to build, to, to, to do other crops. I mean, how we use our land, I think, is a really challenging question, which has really been 
um, underdeveloped in the in the in the, po in the policy regime. It's just whether you're talking about genetically modified crops or hard questions like wind wheel siding. We want we want, re we want renewable energy. Right? Should we destroy the peaks that the untrammeled peaks of some of the most beautiful mountains in the world to do so? Are you studying? You were in Vermont, right? Before so this we, is a big issue. This is a huge issue in, in Vermont, and uh, you know I've I've you know, and, and, then, and then sort of like, I've, I've suggested that we perhaps need to categorize, like, how beautiful they are. And the most beautiful ones we can't put windmills on. And, and but this is, these are real challenging questions about how do you, what, what is the best and most appropriate ways uh, to use our land. And, and I think the, the economic constraints of all this, our demand for, for energy and the demand for perhaps cleaner energy, kind of complicates this. Um, there's no easy answer to your question. I think the, the, back, the, the initial point where we should recognize that this land use question is, is a huge and important one. Absolutely. And there, too, you end up with these concentric circles. Like, when you look at it in a macro way, uh, Jesse Osabel at Rockefeller University and David Victor at UC San Diego years ago wrote a paper about the greening, about the return of a greener earth. And they did all these calculations that showed the more condensed, the more the more industrialized our agriculture is, the more room there is for nature. The before and deforestation rates slow down. So you can, if you sort of cluster your catastrophe and control it, uh, then you can actually end up with a green planet overall. It's just something that's worth looking at. And, and, and our own human development matters quite a bit. You know, yeah. urban, suburban, and now ex-urban development are all part of this. Yeah. So there's another question in the back. Hi, my name is Simone. Stand up, please. Hi, my name is Simone, I'm a communications major, and I feel really overwhelmed talking about this subject, and I would just like your opinion on um, agribusinesses funding um, agricultural research at colleges, and if that's ethical because everything's based on evidence, so I just want to hear. Pam, could you hear that okay? Uh, turn on your mic, sorry. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Uh, I'll repeat it. Uh, basically, she was asking about, um, is it problematic that a lot of uh, university research on these issues is funded by industry, the agriculture industry? So how do you retain the credibility? And, and how do you avoid kind of a torquing of overall um, knowledge base or findings when, in, in a situation like that? Yeah, I think I appreciate the student's concern. And of course, as, as was brought up earlier, uh, this, this idea of disclosure is very important. Who funds your research? It doesn't necessarily mean that if it's funded by a company it's wrong, but it's really important to disclose that information. I actually uh, check with the university here at University of California Davis to find out well what exactly is the percentage of faculty funded by Monsanto? And we have a budget of, of seven last year or the year before of seven hundred and fifty four million dollars is a research budget here. And um, there are a few projects uh, funded by Monsanto, specific projects, and they amount to less than one-tenth of one percent of the entire research budget. And I think that is very typical of many institutions that the percentage funded by these, um, uh, these large companies is very, very, very small. So I don't have any funding from Monsanto. All my funding comes from the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that's actually very, uh, very typical of a plant biologist. So there's sort of this uh, idea that you can find abundantly on the internet that anybody that studies plant biology for a profession is funded by Monsanto, and that is uh, fortunately incorrect, uh, but I, I think I appreciate the, the question. And I also wanted to just mention that I appreciate the other question and Jason's answer as well because I think this idea of, you know, how are we going to handle our land, this earth, this one earth that we have, that is really a critical question. And that is what is so much more important than I, what I see as a distraction on how the seed was developed because we really need to consider how we can conserve biodiversity, how we can keep those peaks free of, of um, wind, wind, windmills, and how can we use uh, less land and less water to produce 
the food and energy that, that we need. And I think that's where the important uh, debate is going to occur, and there's many different uh, answers for that. And this idea that genetic engineering is going to solve all our problems is certainly not correct. It's, it's really just one tool. Sometimes it'll be appropriate technology, and, and sometimes not. And so we really need to keep in mind these larger goals of uh, living sustainably on this planet. We have another question queued up, but I wanted to ask Nathaniel something ripping off of that last one, which was about um, you know, some, there have been some accusations that industries, safety studies, for example, on um, uh, the corn, GM corn, where they, they, they run too short a test. So that the Seralini study, study that some people in the room probably have heard about, where they have these big tumorous rats, uh, a study that's been widely debunked. But well, their main criticism was, well, we have, we're trying to do a you know, longer lifespan study of health effects. Um, what, what's your sense overall in having canvassed all this research? And by the way, can you remind people what the website is? That, that, that short, there was a nice short uh, way to get to your series. Um, I, if, you, if you Google panic-free GMOs, um, Panic-free GMOs. Panic-free GMOs. And grist. Um, grist.org is the website. Um, you'll find it. Um, so I think my, my surprise here was, you know, um, that at, at how much science had been done. And, uh, you know, Jason, Jason made the point that the science is developing, and it's true because new forms of, of uh, genetically modified foods keep coming out, but the main ones that we use have been around for a long time, and for that, the public health question has been answered as definitively as any uh, question can. You know, there's, um, I'm a very precautionary type of guy. I'm, I feel like if something is uncertain, let's let's wait on it um, <laughs> until we until we can answer it. But we can never we can never have absolute certainty. At some point, we we set up enough hoops for ourselves and say, okay, well, we have a reasonable level of um, information on this. And um, and with with the genetically modified foods, that, uh, the crops that we, the stables that we've developed so far, um, we've really met that standard. You know, I was just I was just amazed to look at you know each. Um, scientific organization going through and taking a, an amazing thorough look at this with all of these scientists from all different walks of life coming together looking at just the independent science doing spending millions of dollars doing decades of, of research on uh, their own science um, you know the Swiss the Swiss did a moratorium for five years and they just came out with um, their findings on this after five years uh, of looking at it and said, and there, the headline was um, risks and significant, um, significant benefits possible for GMOs. So, um, so there, I, you know, it's, it's very hard to do a long-term uh, trial. There's, there's fewer of those and you start to get confounding factors and, you know, it's even harder to then look at the, the population in general, and see, you know, is has has there been an effect? You know, we we haven't been able to figure out the the simplest thing as to um, what we're supposed to be eating. You know, we can't task science with just telling us, okay, what what's making us fat? We haven't figured that out um, because there's these big um, epidemiological studies are really hard to do. So it gets much more fuzzy when you you look at that. But in terms of just basic um, Weighing of risk, I, I, I'm fairly confident that, that that's been done. So we're going to close out fairly soon. We have about 10 more minutes, um, and I want to get each person on the panel to weigh in a little bit with their sort of closing thoughts in a few minutes. There are a couple more questions. Here's Carlos. Hi, <coughs> my name is Carlos, I'm a business major, and uh, blogging. I think this is one of the last to get more information on the GMOs. I've heard two things. First, that uh, there are seeds that are uh, modified to die after the first year. So I want to know how ethical would that be within a feed the world mindset. And the second thing, um, back in Mexico, there was a lot of protest because apparently Monsanto genes threatened the diversity of corn over there. So I want to know 
what does that mean? How would uh, GMO corn uh, threaten corn diversity? So seed privatization and profit, um, does that actually benefit the world? And and uh, are we, we're, we're, this gets back to someone else, maybe it's Jason, talking about reduced diversity generally, are we heading toward a world of, that will end up being more vulnerable because we're sort of, if we neglect um, the... Um, On the second question, I, I'll just, two brief points. I mean, on a legal perspective, one of the, the concerns amongst uh, farmers who don't use uh, genetically modified crops is they worry about those genetically modified crops mixing with their crops. And there was a lawsuit in the United States about alfalfa and, and whether, you know, alfalfa, genetically modified alfalfa should be deregulated or not, and it ultimately was deregulated. So there are farmers who have concerns about, about that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it, I think it's wonderful that we have a scientist on the panel. I mean, there is this concern about, um, you know, disease and the banana is a fan, 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 fascinating one. I think I read in the, the, the New York Times like a year ago that the banana we all eat now isn't the banana everybody used to eat and we all eat because it, it's, it, it is at risk of, of, of disease. So that might be an example which she mentioned that um, where it's important for us to think about how can we make it to make uh, food more disease resistant otherwise we might lose that food supply for a, a huge population of Right. Um, Pam, did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, turn on your mic. Yeah. So I think uh, the question was about uh, monoculture, and yeah. I think again, it's a it's a really important question. We have to consider how we. Sorry about that. Um, we really need to consider how to enhance biodiversity of our crops because we've known for. Uh, over a hundred years that if you plant all the same crop over a very wide area that um, these crops become more susceptible to epidemics and of course that is the same issue whether the crop is genetically engineered or not genetically engineered and it often is a difficult decision for the farmer so if they have a crop that they like um, their, their consumers like um, it's very robust. They don't have to, perhaps they don't have to spray insecticides because it has um, inborn traits for resistance or, or genetically engineered resistance. There's a tendency to plant a lot of it, and again, that's the same whether it's genetically engineered or not genetically engineered. Um, one thing we have seen, uh, I think, a really good example is is BT cotton. So it's um, just to remind you, it's the cotton that expre expresses this uh, protein BT. And the farmers uh, in Arizona are able to spray half the uh, synthetic insecticides than the conventional cotton. And so it's been very beneficial for the environment and for consumers. And as um, Nate mentioned earlier, farm workers, because uh, they're less exposed to toxic substances. But because it's such a powerful seed, is a temptation to plant a lot of it. But what the USDA did is they mandated a crop diversity strategy and it's been very very successful so farmers must plant if they want to plant BT cotton they have to plant mixtures um, so it reduces the, the selection pressure on the pests and I think um, that's really a model project that we've seen in Arizona um, it's thought to be very effective and one reason it was so effective is that you had geneticists working with ecologists, working with entomologists, working with farmers and I, I truly believe that that is the kind of um, approach that, that we do need to take. Boy that's incredible, that, actually I want to write about that. that I, I, as you were describing that, that USDA, it was D, USDA, not FDA, as you were describing it I was thinking how could that have made it through our regulatory process? It's too sane. It's too logical. Yeah, the so the I, expert on that is Bruce Bruce Tabashnik at University of Arizona, and he can provide you a lot of uh, really fantastic information on on the theory behind planting these uh, mixtures and the efficacy. I, it reminds me, about ten years ago, I wrote an article for the New York Times. Uh, there was a paper in Science about a, a giant scale, a China scale experiment in, in some province in China. Oh, actually, turn off your microphone for a second. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Where um, they were mandated, the farmers in that the rice farmers in that region were mandated to do mixed uh, cropping of rice with two, more than one variety, and they had higher productivity as a result. And China, it was it can only happen in China where they could sort of say, 
this county, you're going to plant all the rice this way now. But it, but apparent, but it actually was a rigorous, uh, I think it was Tillman, I can't remember, who did it. Great, great work. So, so any other are there any other examples that any of you, Jason or, or Shelley or Nathaniel, who, where you see either the future that you want, where you see it kind of out there? Because William Gibson, this famous futurist writer, I quote him all the time, he said, the future is here now. It's just not evenly distributed. It's kind of hiding. So what do, do you see that's out there hiding that you think is really promising? Shall we? I've been going to Iowa because my son goes to college there. And like four years ago when I started going, it was like kind of horrifying to me to see all that corn and see one crop, one crop. And little by little, I've gone and I know there's a place um, that's been licensed to make incredibly delicious and very traditionally made prosciutto right outside of Des Moines. And you see the farmer's market right in the town of Grinnell, where it goes to school, it gets bigger and bigger. And kind of my takeaway so far from what I've heard is, like, what it always has to be, I guess, is a balance. And so you may be less fearful of, of uh, science and big crops, but uh, maybe I've been become a little bit skeptical about, oh, make sure it's local, make sure it's local, and not thinking about how well, we have to feed everybody, we have to feed everybody. But the ways in which you get monocrops, besides it happening accidentally, is also, like I've been saying before, because it just becomes too expensive to grow and ship, you know, really good things. So if there's, like, small, local, uh, safe ways of growing foods that are diverse, combined with maybe the need to do really larger-scale agriculture, I'm sure that, you know, we'll have to do a balance the two. That reminds me of an article, Mark, Mark Bittman, uh, of the New York Times food columnist wrote a piece not long ago about big agriculture that he liked. He, mm -hmm. he was in the tomato area of California, and he really dug in on. And he's a guy who's very much um, a foodie, uh, sort of a liberal, reflexively anti-GMO foodie. But he um, he saw a way to do tomatoes, particularly that he thought was going to, uh, you know, for canned tomatoes, it was the way to make tomatoes affordable and grow them sustainably. It was interesting. So it's kind of like in different places you see these different examples. I don't know, Jason, is there anything that looks like the future to you? I mean, again, in terms of regulatory models, you know, Sweden, uh, what do you see out there that feels like the future? What feels like the future to me is where lo locally, you know, people think a little bit more about what they're eating in their local economies and we continue to see green markets sprouting up. It's a great set that future in a lot of places. Um, but, you know, 72% of Americans live in suburban or exurban developments and drive a lot. And so I think the future there is uh, what you are seeing in parts of Northern Europe where, um, you know, regular people, uh, working class, middle class, the working poor, have um, access to responsibly, ecologically grown, industrial organic food. Um, that's pretty good and pretty healthy and perhaps imperfect, but, you know, it's good. I mean, I think at least domestically in the United States, we have the, if we can get to that point for, for you know, most of the U.S., that would be a wonderful, great thing. Um, and I think you need to do a lot better job of worrying about the people who are food insecure. You don't even have access to the, the basic uh, things that they need to have to maintain a healthy diet. And I think in that way, both globally and domestically, there's a lot of work to be done. And that's, in some ways, this conversation uh, is on, you know, this whole conversation is, not the whole, but a lot of this conversation is unfair to those, those people. Um, I mean, it, it comes up a lot in our discussion of, 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 of making crops that are drought resistant and things like that, but that, that's a huge component of that, that you know, we don't think enough. So, uh, Nathaniel, what's, have you seen the future that you would like? <laughs> well, my future, but I think, um, is is still developing. I mean, I think that we're getting close to it in in places in California where you know, um, we're seeing these community supported agriculture. You know, I get my food in a box and uh, from from near where Pam lives and. Uh, I, I go and visit this farm, and it's a, a place that uh, makes me feel good when I'm there, and it makes me feel good to eat the food uh, from there. Um, and the the question is, 
how do we get there? You know, I, I'd like to snap my fingers and have the world look more like that and have that be progressing to, to be more and more sustainable itself. Um, but in the meantime, we've got to make the big uh, industrial uh, agricultural system better too um, and allow it to, to be as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, and so, and I think that uh, GMOs really have a role in that. The other thing I'd just like to say, though, is the future really isn't the United States. Um, we're we're going to be kind of having this debate, and it's going to be kind of a, a sideshow. The the future is really um, is really Southeast Asia and Africa, and and there the future is you know going to we're going to have to be looking at at poverty um, and what does it take to to lift up a, a poor farmer that's that's scraping out a living um, very tenuously from the soil. Um, so, so I'd really like to, you know, the UN did this um, international assessment of agricultural technology, and, and I, I thought that was a very smart document. I'd like to see, you know, and, and that called for a mix of, you know, perhaps the, some some GMOs um, were appropriate, and um, and a lot of traditional technologies and focusing in on this problem of, um, of distribution and governance. This sounds great. Uh, so we're going to start, we're close to wrapping things up. This has been incredibly valuable. The students in the room have been incredibly uh, durable because <laughs> it's, it's a good discussion, uh, but it's, it's, it's intense and draining and complicated. Um, I want to make a couple of quick points, too. Um, one, I have seen the future actually with some Pace University students a few years ago. We were in the Belize at an innovative shrimp farm run, developed there over two, 20 years by an American expatriate that uh, essentially doesn't let any bad stuff leave the ponds. They, you know, one of the big problems with shrimp farming is the effluent that goes into nearby systems and pollutes the, the reef and that kind of thing. But she developed sort of a closed system where the, uh, the shrimp are grown in sort of a bath of stuff. Uh, Complicated mix, everything from orange rind from a nearby, from a nearby uh, orange processing plant to uh, bacteria that naturally grow there. And uh, but you still, right now, you cannot go into the market and at least not the markets I go to and find shrimp that are, have a label <laughs> that are done. The, the, the shrimp industry is starting to move slowly with the World Wildlife Fund toward a labeling process. So we might eventually have a way to normalize that as something we can all reach for as a consumer. But it, so we did a film about it, uh, part of our Pace documentary course, Shrimp Farming, Pace University, Google for that, you can find it. And I think the more we can build a sense that there are choices, and the more we can use communication portals to convey those choices and make sure when we're educating people that they learn where stuff comes from. Uh, my son and I, my son likes mango juice. We go to the market in Cold Spring where I live, and there's this nice mango juice, it's Luza, L-O-O-Z-A. Turns out, we looked at the label one day. It comes from Belgium. So just process that idea for a minute. The mango juice that I buy pretty affordably in Cold Spring comes from Belgium. The mangoes obviously didn't come from Belgium. They came from somewhere. They went to Belgium. But they got turned into juice and moved to um, Cold Spring, New York. So the more we can make, if you have a device, I think we're moving to the world where you know, you'll just be able to put your phone on that and kind of just have that information swim around you. The more we have that openness, that transparency, the better off we'll be. Um, aquaponics is this wonderful process where you're growing plants and fish and together using the, you know, they're basically working off of each other's nutrients and excrement and stuff. And I've seen experiments in that that are incredible. Uh, so that means the whole idea of the local board, the idea of local grown stuff is going to change. It, you know, it might be a tilapia that you can grow you know, in your property here in the Hudson Valley or in New York City, um, and and or some other fish that's a vegetarian fish, and so you're not feeding fish to fish to take it to the ocean to make, to make us all happy. So, so I, I mean, to me, the, the what I what I, I and I see glimpses of this, but I think what we can all work for is an environment where whatever whatever your expertise is, whether it's communication, whether it's basic science, whether it's um, um, education, you can find a niche and fostering kind of the sustainable food norms. Of course, it gets at the choices you make, how you cook, and, and all that stuff as well. I think it, there's, there's a great prospect for a better outcome than there ever has been. Partially, largely, of course, I'm biased toward communication tools, as I think Nathaniel is. 
uh, I think there's just we're really poised for, for some good outcomes here. If, if anyone on the panel has one last sort of almost um, bumper sticker like conclusion, uh, raise your hand. That includes you guys. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've seen studies, uh, I mean, a lot of your environmental studies uh, majors, but I've seen surveys of environmental studies majors, and they're depressed. And they're depressed because they read about climate change and they can't make a difference. But I, I would just submit to you that your, your, your daily choices about environmental issues and your daily food choices can actually make a big difference in the aggregate. You know, think about maybe one day going vegetarian rather than having some beef. You know, think about where your food is coming from. You know, those sort of intentional choices can make a huge difference in the aggregate. Um, and so, you know, so, so you you know, you make a difference. Yeah, you can follow up like cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Anything last from you, Pam? I have uh, something I, very important to say, which is to thank our host, Andy Revkin, and uh, my co-panelists. I really appreciate the chance to participate, and I believe these kinds of discussions are you know, helpful for all of us. We learn from each other and also uh, the audience. And um, I really appreciate that so many top-notch journalists have taken an interest in, in plant biology and agriculture. There's, it's really uh, flabbergasting compared to 25 years ago when I began this work till till today and I and we definitely need these excellent journalists to help communicate the basic science to uh, the public so thank you all and thank you all in the audience for participating that's a certainly gr great place to uh, wrap things up so I, I, and the last thing the last thing is uh, Twitter this conversation can continue I'm using that hashtag pace food. I'm going to throw some links out there uh, in a few minutes to stuff that I think is relevant. It would be great if everyone on the panel, if you had some something that's online, just put a tweet. You're up, uh, Pam, are you, you're not on Twitter, are you? Or are you, are you not? I couldn't find your Twitter account. Oh, yeah. Where? I'm on Twitter. I'm following you. What's your <laughs> app? What's your ID? What's your... At PC Ronald. Oh, okay, great. So again, I, my, my mandate to the panel and also to the audience here and, and, and more widely on the Internet uh, is use pace, pace food as a way to conglomerate and uh, share ideas and shape and keep this conversation going. So thank you again. Thank you all. <laughs>